delighted uh, to be with you today. I actually had been in training all morning and I couldn't miss Tracy even if I wanted to. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you, Tracy. Tracy is a master certified coach, a training coaching supervisor, a trained coaching supervisor, a mentor coach, an amazing one for sure, and an ICF assessor. Uh, she trains and works with managers and leaders to develop their coaching capability. She also, she's also an international corporate executive and board level coach, a leadership development designer and facilitator, working with uh, many, many organizations. Tracy also specializes in working with organizations to support them in developing their coaching culture. We just need like 10 of you, Tracy, not one. Um, Tracy has authored, co-authored a book, Becoming a Coach, The Essential ICF Guide, published in 2020. And it provides a comprehensive guide to coaching for all types of coaches and especially different levels of skills. I use your tools, Tracy, in my class at their university with HRD students who want to become better coaches. Uh, and she uh, also founded Coaching with Conscience. At, as part of this work, she collaborates closely with MIND, the UK's leading mental health charity, bringing coaching services to those who are supporting local communities with mental health challenges. What a beautiful uh, way to give back to the community, Tracy. Tracy was named as one of the leading global coach winners of the Thinkers 50 Marshall Goldsmith Awards of 2019. She was a finalist for the Thinkers 50 Coaching Mentoring Award in 2021. She's a member of the Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches. She was president of the UK ICF chapter from 2013 to 2014 as has, and has served in many, many roles in the ICF Global Board Director. Thank you, Tracy, for everything you bring to the coaching community. Well, thank you, Lubna, and it's um, an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you. I was going to say this evening, because of course, for me, it is starting to become the evening, but, uh, but this afternoon, perhaps, um, I really, really love connecting with as many people as I can. And um, talking about the wonderful topic of ethics and professionalism this evening, let's see how exciting we can make that. Um, but before before we start, I also just want to um, acknowledge that I know that all of you have been experiencing some very challenging weather conditions with hurricanes and storms and things. And so I really appreciate you being here. And um, and I do hope that your family and friends are well. Um, I know I've just seen from some of the pictures here that we see in the UK, the amount of devastation that these kinds of things cause. And um, I'm just wanting to acknowledge that and thank you for being here because I'm sure there's quite a lot going on in your worlds for many of you um, with all of that going on. Um, so ethics and or professionalism and ethics. Well, one of the reasons I think that it would be lovely to talk about this, apart from the fact that it's really, really important, um, so important that we have a code of ethics, of course, and so important that as I can see some people are noting in the chat, we are required to do at least three CCEs every three years on ethics as a reminder to ground ourselves back in that, um, in that practice. And the reason that I also uh, wanted to share this kind of topic was because, in fact, some of you may, may or may not be aware, but when the ICF did the research and the job analysis that was done that resulted in the updated ICF core competency model that we now have, certain key patterns and themes came out of that research. It was a really, really rigorous two year body of work that was done um, with um, all sorts of different kinds of analysis from ranging from listening to recordings, analyzing recordings, um, workshops, surveys with people who were coaches and non-coaches, ICF, non-ICF from all over the world. And a number of key themes kept coming up over and over and over and over again in the research that um, 
those who then compiled the competency model felt really needed to be underscored in the model. And one of those core themes was um, ethical and professional conduct, and, and particularly within that, confidentiality. So we know that above all else, this part of our work is incredibly important. And, and I think personally, it's something that really, really differentiates us from many, many other coaches to have an ICF credential, to be an ICF trained coach, an ICF practitioner is, I think, really holding ourselves to the highest possible standards uh, in terms of how we operate. So just the fact that we're all here doing that for me makes me feel good because we're all invested in some shape or form in in wanting to be the best that we can be. So this evening, or this afternoon, sorry, I wanted to um, just share a little bit, not necessarily for us to go through the ICF Code of Ethics line by line, that might be rather dry and boring, um, but more to talk about how ethics can actually come to life and how we can understand um, where ethics comes from almost and what our ethical platform is. And then we will dip into the code of ethics a little bit, um, perhaps towards the end. Uh, you don't have to have the code of ethics available to you right now um, if you don't want to. But I guess if you do have it, you might you might be able to get some answers to a little quiz that I might pose for us later on. And um, I'm going to share my screen. I've got some slides that I'd love to share. Uh, don't worry about necessarily copying the content of the slides if you don't want to, because we will make a copy of these available to you afterwards. So you'll have a full set of that. Um, and I'll come on, off, on and off of the slides, if I may, because it's so much nicer to actually engage and talk with you rather than just look at the screen all the time. So I'll try and come off of the slides as much as I can. Um, and, and, and as we go along, if you have observations or comments or questions, please either feel free to come off mute and ask. You know, I'd love to hear your, your voices and hear your thoughts, your reflections, your opinions, um, or put them in the chat if you would like to as well. And Jimmy's going to help me just make sure that we don't miss anything that you're saying. So please, you know, Come in, don't, don't, don't necessarily wait for me to stop talking. Please come in if you've got things that you would like to bring so that we can make it a good dialogue. Okay, well, I'll share the screen and uh, let's see how we get on and make a start. So just put that onto slideshow. Hopefully everyone can see. I'm just going to move my camera for a second so that I can still see you. There we go. Okay, um, so ethics and professionalism in coaching. Well, first of all, just to connect us back with the overview of the ICF core competency model, this may be something that is very familiar to some of you now. Um, and for some of you, maybe if you have been trained in the previous model, like I was, um, you're still, your, your familiarity might still be with the 11 competency model, who knows. But this is what we are working with now. This model was approved by the ICF Global Board actually at the end of 2019, in fact. Um, and the original plan was that it would, it would, we would have a transition year through 2020 and that everything would switch over to the new model. So this model in 2021. And then that small matter of a global pandemic somewhat thwarted that goal and slowed everything down. So we now have had the model much more available since um, pretty much a little bit into last year, but mostly into this year. And as some of you may be aware, as of August, the um, ICF credentialing application system has switched across now to this model. So any applications now received for ICF credentials are now assessed and reviewed against this model. Now, obviously the model um, isn't, this isn't all there is to it. There are sub, 
sub-competencies sitting underneath all of these, but here you have the list of them. And I just wanted to share this to, I guess, kind of give us some context, if you, if you like, around where tonight's conversation sits within the whole piece. And you'll see within these competencies, these eight competencies that are clustered under four domains, A, B, C and D, you'll see on the right hand side that there is an informal way of looking at these, which is to consider them the doing competencies and the being competencies. And the doing competencies, which are three through eight, are typically viewed as the competencies that are associated with things that coaches do. Things they do, things they say, things they don't say, things they don't do. So very much focused on the behavioural aspect of a coach. And in fact, in the recordings that we send into the ICF, <clears throat> it's typically those competencies three through eight that are most directly assessed. But then we have this foundation domain, which by the nature of the word itself, foundation, is intended through those two competencies, demonstrates ethical practice and embodies a coaching mindset, are intended to lay the foundation or the platform from which we coach. And those competencies, if anything, are focusing more on us as the practitioner in terms of how we are, who we are, who we are being and how we are operating. And they are then intended with that solid platform, intended to positively inform the doing of our coaching practice. <clears throat> and what we then find is that many of those competencies or many aspects of those two competencies will directly inform our ability to do the other doing competencies well. For example, um, part of our ethical practice is that we are expected to have very clear coaching agreements. So of course, in that regard, competency one fuels and underpins competency three. Um, competency two embodies a coaching mindset fuels and informs all sorts of the other competencies. Um, it's very difficult to cultivate trust and safety if I haven't got an appropriate mindset as a coach or to maintain presence or even to listen well. So my ability to really demonstrate these doing competencies is underpinned by these two foundational ones. And the one that I'd love for us to focus on this evening is really embedded within competency one, demonstrates ethical practice. So we're not necessarily going to be going through that competency per se in detail, but we are going to have a look at it and really think about what are the ethical and professional considerations that are contained within it. So, and I'm just noticing, Jimmy, because I'm on screen share, I can't see the chat so easily. So if you do see anything coming in the chat, please feel free to tell me. Will do. Okay. So this is competency one, demonstrates ethical practice. And all of the competencies in the updated model, if you haven't seen it, they're all very consistent in their structure. They all have a title. And the beginning word of every title is an active verb. And then they all have a definition and they all have a certain number of sub competencies. And there are certain words that are really um, useful to think about in terms of really words that have been very deliberately chosen. Because once again, with the research that was done to create this model, Literally every word of every sentence has been chosen for a reason. And things like, for example, understands and consistently applies. We'll see quite a few times in the competency model, things like ongoing, maintains and consistently. And these are all really intentional words that demonstrate that this is something 
that is intended to be part of our general practice and our general way of being and not only when we're with a client. So both competencies one and two speak more broadly than the scope of one, com one coaching conversation or one client engagement. And then what we actually have within this competency are, in fact, many elements that are then repeated elsewhere. And it's in a way, for me, this competency is really underlining or underscoring the significance of these points that are re referred to here, these seven points. And they are very much repeated in other places. So, for example, um, talking about personal integrity and honesty is quoted in the Code of Ethics, um, being sensitive to clients' identity, environment, experiences, values and beliefs, for example, comes up in three or four places in other competencies. Um, use of language comes up in other places. And then, of course, we've got reference to the Code of Ethics and the core values themselves. And then again, with confidentiality, maintaining distinctions, both of those things are highlighted in the Code of Ethics, um, as is number seven, when we refer to other support professionals. So in some ways, this competency doesn't tell us something that isn't anywhere else. It's almost pulling together things that are already in the values, already in the competencies, already in the ethics, and really just underscoring them to say, this, this is what we mean by ethical practice. And if we go to um, the actual overview of the Code of Ethics, as I said, I'm not necessarily intending to, to go through it line by line, although I do have my copy here with me in case anyone does want to dive into some of the granularity of it. Um, that's, that's entirely up to you. But um, just to ground ourselves in the in the structure of it, we have also at the same time that the ICF core competencies were being reviewed, the ICF code of ethics was also being reviewed. And it was just serendipity, I think, in a way that both of those initiatives were launched and ran alongside each other, which meant that both documents uh, updated documents were released into our ICF system around the same time and are therefore cross-referenced quite well. And the Code of Ethics has these five key areas. There's an introductory part that really just sets the scene around why ethics is important to us um, as ICF coaches. And then there's also a piece on key definitions, which I think is really useful um, particularly when it comes to things like confidentiality, conflict of interest, etc. So I would really encourage you to, um, you know, when you have a moment with nothing else to do, pull out the code of ethics and just have a little look through to just really familiarise yourself with some of these definitions and what they might mean for you. What we also have now, which we didn't have in quite such an explicit way uh, before is that the code of ethics also then puts its arms around the ICF core values and yet again they are also something that were worked on and, and refreshed and upgraded so if you haven't seen the work on those I would really encourage you to have a look at the ICF website um, on both the core values and the code of ethics. On both areas, values and ethics, there are some useful video clips with people who have been involved explaining things. There are also a lot of um, interpretative statements, especially around the code of ethics, to help us more deeply understand what was the thinking that went into those various elements of the code. And then the main part of the Code of Ethics is section four, which is where we have the standard actually in, in, embraced. And that has four sections, our responsibility to clients, to practice and performance, to professionalism, and then to society, which is also a shift from 
our focus before on really thinking about not just um, our clients and our professionalism and the practice of coaching, but to think much, much more systemically now on the context and the impact that coaching and our work has in a broader community, organisation or system. And then lastly, we have the pledge, <clears throat> which is where we agree to abide by the code of ethics. So that's the, that's the structure that we have. And what I'd love to do now um, is to just really move into thinking about what does ethics actually mean for us? So in some ways, we could think of a code of ethics as a, as a GPS system, you know, a sat-nav a sat in a way for coaches. And when I started to think about it this way, I found it much more helpful. And I must admit, when I first became a coach, I thought the, I thought the ICF code of ethics was a rule book, you know, and it, was, it set out all of the rules of all of the things that I had to do and if I, you know, if I didn't do them, the ICF police would be coming around and taking my credential away or something like that. It felt very much like quite a, you know, a punitive document that it was something that I had to do. But when I actually started to get involved in, initially in, in ethical workshops, when I was um, on the board of the UK ICF chapter, I suddenly realised that actually this isn't this isn't a rule book or something that we can be policed on. It's actually something that's really, really helpful to help support us and, in fact, to help protect us. Um, and, you know, as coaching becomes so much more mainstream and we, we live in an ever um, you know, increasingly complex world from a political and legal and societal perspective. Protecting ourselves as professional practitioners is also important. So I would really encourage you to think about how could this document actually be something that isn't only a resource to you um, and a guidance to you, but is also something that helps protect you from challenge, from misunderstanding um, and from any of the, you know, unwelcomed complexities that can come from, from those kinds of misunderstandings. Part of what is included in the Code of Ethics is honouring the core values. And you may have seen that we now have these updated core values of professionalism, collaboration, humanity and equity and these values are also highlighted on the ICF website in a lot more detail to give you um, explanations and a breakdown of what each one of them means and with examples of how we might be demonstrating them. So once again part of our reflective practice a really useful part could be to have a look at some of those core values in a little bit more detail and also think about how do they align um, with our own core values? How do they align with the values that we want to uphold? Um, and I personally have found, in, if I'm being completely transparent, um, some of these values, when I look at them in detail, I think, yes, you know, absolutely, I can do that with absolute congruence and alignment and then some of the things in the ICF core values challenge and test me because I'm not always so good at them um, and I can give you one example which is in humanity not that I would like to think I was inhumane in any way um, but part of the subset of the humanity value talks about us being kind and compassionate um, including to ourselves, that we are not perfect. And as someone who is a recovering perfectionist, shall we say, that's, that's not always easy for me because I'm not always as compassionate to myself as perhaps I would like to be. And so honouring that value truly um, is something that is part of my own personal growth. So I, I would really encourage you to have a look at those and think about which of those 
are second nature to you, that you live and breathe comfortably? And which of them do test you in some way? And, and, and how do you feel and think about that? And what might you want to do? Ultimately, good reasons, I think, to have a code of ethics is really to honour ourselves and our clients. And I've always felt myself very proud to be part of the ICF and proud to have an ICF credential. Um, the ICF credential is by far the most recognised credential all over the world. And I believe that part of that is because of the ICS rigour. The ICF credential, I think, is probably one of the hardest to get in the world in terms of professional bodies. Um, and that means that every one of us who have done the work and continue to do the work to go towards those credentials and get those credentials, I feel can really hold their heads high as, a, as someone who is investing in professionalism and abiding by that code of ethics. Therefore, I feel can enhance your credibility um, because of the standards that you are applying, because of the consistency of your practice and the clarity of expectations that comes from the kind of contracting and establishing agreements that you do. And having the code of ethics protects all of us, ourselves, our clients, the organizations and systems that we work with, um, and really is identifying or highlighting how we want to adopt best practice wherever we can. And, in many cases, it's very useful. I don't know what, what kind of practices you're all having here, but it can be very, very useful to make a reference perhaps to the code of ethics in your coaching contracts. I know some coaches um, attach an appendix of the code of ethics to their contracts. Some people like to do that. And some people maybe put a hyperlink to the code of ethics in their contract um, just so that clients, if they want to have a look, will we'll, we'll know where to go. So let's then have a look and I'll just share this next slide and then come off screen and check in with some of you. I'd like to think about for a moment, what is it that actually informs our own code of ethics? You know, it's one thing to have a code that's given to us on a, paper, on a piece of paper or on a document by the ICF. But what does what does ethics mean to us? What are the roots or the sources of our ethical practice or our ethical conduct? So I'm just going to stop the screen there for a moment. I'd love to just see if there are any, um, any thoughts on that, any ideas on what it is that informs your ethical platform. Chris, I can see your hands up. Please do come in. Thank you very much. Um... For me, personally, it would be my morals and my values that are my roots to, to keeping ethics. Yeah, so morals and values, absolutely. Um, and it's interesting then, isn't it, how we see that the ICF Code of Ethics has partnered that document with the, uh, with the values as well. Yeah, what about anyone else? Is morals and values relevant for you? And, and maybe where do... Where do some of those morals and values come from? What informs the morals and values? Any thoughts on that? I think for me, it's my, um, my life experiences, um, my culture, I guess, in a way, um, how, that, uh, how I perceive that and how I learned from that or um or maybe yeah it, that's that's kind of how I think about it yeah thank you Shakti so definitely things like our life experience how what kind of life we've led um and also the culture that we come from which could be family culture but it could also be an industry culture couldn't it you know our, our ethics could be informed by the organizational culture or industry culture that we've spent many years in perhaps, yeah. Iris, I think you were going to maybe bring something in as well. Did you want to come in? Yes, I would agree with that. Certainly my values come from my culture and my family of origin. 
I'm glad to say, and from my uh, many decades of experience in the social services field and other life experiences, certainly. Yeah, thank you. So you, you give a lovely example there of your experience in the social services field. So there's a, a sector, isn't there, that you've been immersed in that has informed who you feel you are as a professional. Yeah, that's Absolutely. a great example. Yeah. Anything else? Any other thoughts on what informs your ethical practice? Or your ethical roots, as it were? <clears throat> I, I think for me, a big part of it is professionalism. Um, in the sense that because it's an unregulated field and there's so, I think, so much um, opportunity for misconception about what coaching is that for me, it's really important to just show a high standard of the dependability and the value and wanting to um, be an example of that to promote that. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So professionalism. And and where where does, it, for you, Melissa, what where does your sense or your value around professionalism come from, do you think? <laughs> that's a great question. So that's what I was trying to come up with the answer to that before I spoke. Uh, and uh, just a, a, a pride in what I do, uh, I think, is what it is, because it's a reflection of myself as well for me and just being um, respecting others and wanting to provide that type of um, connection and just, um, you know, with many of us in our businesses, our face is our business, right? So in yeah. that sense of how does that, how is that demonstrated? And we demonstrate through example um, and how yeah. we um, interact with our clients. So um, that's just been, you know, and so much of it is through for me a lot of my work is also through word of mouth or through referrals so right that's going to come across in how am I conducting myself with others absolutely absolutely so there's something I'm hearing very much there that's embedded in your sense of self your sense of identity mm -hmm. professionalism honesty integrity pride professionalism yeah thank you and Tina I think you were going to come in as well Thank you. Um, I was just going to add that um, I've always based my ethics on a set of unchanging beliefs, um, and that came from from childhood, you know, um, and uh, it has stood me in good stead throughout my career, my coaching, etc. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Tina. So we see here how some of these roots can come from very early on in our lives, can't they, from childhood in our formative years that are morals, values that stay with us forever. And, and whether we're conscious of it always or not, they are informing everything that we're doing. Um, I've also seen Barry put something in the chat here about perhaps religion. Absolutely. So our spiritual um, practice our religious practices or beliefs and the um, and and the experiences that we've had with that are also going to inform our code of ethics so if I share the screen again you'll see some of what you've been um, bringing in and and a few other ideas so let's have a little look and see what else we can um, we can bring into this so I don't know if, how easy it is to see all of these words here, but I'll call them out. And as I say, you will get the um, you will get the slides afterwards. But these little bubbles around the um, outside here are all examples of different types of sources, potentially of ethical practice or ethical um, foundation, if you like. We've got family, which we've thought about. Um, we've also got religion, which was said, we've got culture. Consequences is this little tiny one here is part of our ethical decision making could be driven by the consequences of doing or not doing something. Um, we've got our values, which has been shared. We've also got the social groups that we are part of. 
friendship groups, social groups within our society or our um, social circle. Socioeconomic factors can influence our ethical platform, our ethical stance, even geography of where we were born or where we live. Um, our age, perhaps, I mean, we know as we engage with various generations over various years, the moral compass, the values, the ethical um, standpoint of different age groups can vary over time. Even things like gender could influence our thinking that maybe there is something around um, our, our sense of identity, our sexuality, our orientation, that also in, influences our ethical standpoint. And then we have ethnicity, and then also our education, where we were educated, how long we were educated, what kind of education we had or did not have, could also be um, really important. And then I see another note here, Shakti's put in, I feel that my overall experiences in life have impacted me, my values and my morals and therefore my ethical practices. Absolutely. So we've got going on, you know, underneath us, fueling us, a whole range of influences that we may or may not be thinking about consciously, but they're all there in the mix underpinning how we react and how we think about things. Jimmy, you wanted to come in. Yeah, so I know we're talking, it seems like anyway, but of our ethics, and we're saying that everybody has different ethics based on these different experiences and different uh, demographics, if you will, and, and cultural things. What if we have problems with our ethics that of the person we're coaching? like? We see things very, very differently. And we think, well, how does that stay true to my values? And I know we have to honor everyone else's and our clients in this particular case, their position um, on ethics. But what position does that put us in when we have to work with somebody who has a very different ethical barometer? Yeah, I just stopped sharing so I can see you properly while we're talking about that. What a, what a great question. Someone else said great question there. Um, I mean, I do have some thoughts about that, but I'd love to hear if anyone else would like to share, you know, what happens then when our ethical platform is contrary in some way to the ethical platform of the person we're coaching? What do we do about that? That's a tricky one, isn't it? Come on, somebody help me. <laughs> uh, I'll jump in. This is Tony. Did I interrupt? Go ahead, Tony. Okay. So um, that is a really great question. And I guess there would be, I would have two maybe responses. One is if I'm not coaching their ethics, in other words, if I'm coaching a, a situation they brought to the table, then I can maybe not get involved in that if I can separate myself from that. And if I can't separate myself from that, then I would have to maybe refer them to another coach. That would be the only responses I could, I could think of. Mm, that's a great, a great perspective, Tony. So the extent to which I can separate myself from that, and I guess stay, stay clean, stay neutral, stay objective, stay present, all of those things. Yeah. I can Melissa, appreciate I think, the position, Tony. I'm curious. Um, in you said that you might refer them to someone else. How, if this person has objectively questionable ethics, who would you refer them to? <laughs> I wouldn't want to dump that on somebody, a friend of mine, a, a fellow coach. And I'm not saying that, you know, to be combative. I'm just like, I agree. I think, you know, referring them to a proper resource is, is certainly a, a, a better option than dealing with it yourself. Um, but my goodness, how, how do I, now how do I tackle that one? Well, 
I guess my answer to that would be for me, um, it could be just a cultural, you know, difference. And, and that would be easy for me to, to probably separate if it is like, you know, I don't know, like if they're, if it's against the law, then I wouldn't refer anybody probably except, <laughs> well, that's an, that's an ethical question because then right. what do you do? Like, do you turn them in or? Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. If it's a gender thing and, and it's something that I can't, <laughs> get, then, then I get it or a, a cultural thing for sure. But yeah, if it's a, if it's a legal issue, then that's a, a whole different thing altogether. I refer you to the police. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would also consider that if it's not a legal um, issue, um, that at the end of the day, it's for each coach and client to make their own decisions. And so I think if, if I would ever make a referral, and I've not realistically been in this position, but if I were to be in that position and make a referral, um, I would refer several people and then just let let things fall out as they as they will. Kind of trust trust that people have it have their own capability to decide whether they do or don't want to work together because whatever you don't feel comfortable with for whatever reason someone else might have absolutely no issues with and but that's for them to decide. Yeah. Absolutely. So in some ways, you know, ethics, ethics and the law are not necessarily the same thing, are they? Something could be legal, but someone might not necessarily perceive it to be ethical. Um, and it's interesting because the code of ethics um, gives us guidance in both ways here. And it's a little bit about finding that that middle ground that I think Tony was exploring is that the, the ethics says on the one hand, and I'm referring to item number 25 here in, any, in case anyone wants to have a look at it afterwards it says that we we avoid discrimination by maintaining fairness and equality in all activities and operations while respecting local rules and cultural practices and then it goes on to outline various elements of um, discrimination it says this includes but is not limited to discriminations on the basis of age race gender expression, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, national origin, disability, or military status. So we are encouraged as coaches to be as adaptable and as flexible to meet other people as much as possible. Uh, and there is a point at which maybe our own value set or our own ethical platform means we can't meet them. You know, as, as Tony was highlighting, at what point can I not put it aside? And then there's another element of the code that guides us on that, that says that we should remain alert to indications that there might be a shift in the value received from the coaching relationship. So if my ethics and my values are so contrary to the other person's, that I am not able to be present, I am not able to hold them with unconditional positive regard. It then says that I should make a change in the relationship or encourage them to seek another coach or another professional service. So we're, we're sort of having to navigate those two elements, aren't we? On the one hand, we're being invited to be as flexible and as adaptable, open and inclusive as we possibly can in society. And at the same time, if we are unable to do that, we must ensure that we are not just carrying on in a relationship that isn't going to work and be respectful for both people. Shanti, you've got your hand up and then we'll maybe move on a little bit. Yeah, and I think maybe the way you just ended what you said answers this question, but if you could clarify. Um, so if you do, in fact, from a personal values and ethical perspective, um, have an issue with someone, but you haven't yet initiated the coaching process, and at this point you would like to hand it off for that reason, but that reason in and of itself then becomes maybe the basis of what somebody might call 
discrimination. Are, are you then not honoring the ethics of the ICF and or are, are you honoring it by virtue of recognizing that and stepping away from the opportunity to do that coaching? Mm. That's a that's a double bind question, Shakti, isn't it? Because in some ways, if I go ahead, I'm honoring the inclusivity element and the non-discriminatory element. If I don't go ahead, I'm honoring the part where I'm acknowledging that there may not be so much value in the relationship. So I, I don't think it's a I don't think it's necessarily something that we can answer as a general principle. It would be something that would have to be explored case by case by case, which is why ethics is a gray area. You know, there's very little binary, it's definitely this or it's definitely that in ethics. It's a very gray area because of the fact that we all have these different perspectives. So, and also with our values, our values, if we look into sort of the, 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 the psychology and the theories behind values, our values have hierarchies. So some values are unchangeable for us. Some values we'd almost you know, give our life for kind of thing. And other values we are prepared to flex on. So we're only talking here about when there is a contradiction between us that we feel is impassable. And, and I would I would personally encourage any coach, if we are faced with that situation, rather than just make a decision ourselves, would be to seek some input, you know, to, to discuss it confidentially with trusted colleagues, perhaps work with that. That's a beautiful supervision topic for anyone that's in coaching supervision to take to a supervisor to work through um, what our stance and our thoughts are. Um, rather than you know make a rash decision but it's it's a it's a tricky area it is a tricky area yeah thank you okay let's go back and have a another look at a few more elements then and then we'll pause again and have a bit more of a discussion i love it when you're bringing these questions and observations um so really what we're looking at with ethics is a hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pairs of glasses that could be worn, you know, and every single one of them has a very slightly different shade of red, shade of blue, shade of green, whatever it is. And so ethics is all about perspective. If the law outlines what is right and wrong, but ethics is not the law. Ethics is about opinion and perspective and the perspective of best practice. And of course, my perspective might be very, very different to the other person's perspective. And so this is where discussion, exploration, and you know, debate almost is really, really important. And to, to look at the difference and try to work through that rather than that difference become a barrier. And one of the things that we know is human nature to do is to do something called rationalization, which I'm sure you've all heard of, which is where because of our values, because of our beliefs, because of our ethical platform, we will rationalize things in order to meet our view of the world, in order to meet our perspective. It's a very human um, you know, very typical human nature thing to do. And just for a bit of fun, these are maybe just a few examples of how someone might rationalise something. Thankfully, none of these are me. Um, but, you know, the person who's in the, the top left hand corner there when they were having their night out with their friends and feeling very high on the amount of beer that they drunk at that time, probably thought that you know, hugging and drinking eight pints of beer, if that's how many there are there, was a really good idea, was a really fun thing to do. But perhaps whether they woke up thinking it was a good idea the next day is another matter. Um, 
I'm now seeing, I don't know if you have these in the US, I'm sure you do, but in the UK, one of the most popular programs nowadays is called Tattoo Fixers, which is where people have had the most incredible tattoos put onto their bodies in some crazy, I don't know, drunken party on a holiday and then come back home and thought, oh my goodness, what on earth have I got, you know, written on my body? So we're all very capable potentially of doing things, saying things in the moment, because at the time we think it was a good idea and we rationalize that behavior in the moment. When in fact, when we look at it in retrospect, it perhaps wasn't the best thing to do, which is why when there is any kind of ethical dilemma, ethical query or niggle that you're having, the, the best rule of thumb I could offer is slow down, wait, think, consider, consult, rather than jump to an immediate decision. Because usually there is more to an ethical scenario than meets the eye. There's, there's normally more information than perhaps we are aware of. So I'm wondering what might be some of the kinds of rationalizations that we, you as coach practitioners, could come across. Let me just stop sharing for a moment. What could be examples of something that a coach could rationalize and go ahead with when in fact it's perhaps not probably the best thing to do? Anyone got any ideas? I can give you one while you're thinking, if you like. <clears throat> I was working with a coach. Um, I'd been, I'd trained the coach um, on one of their modules. And when they then finished their coaching training and set up their practice, they came back to me um, for some coaching supervision, a session later on. And they came back and said that they were really, really excited because they just won their first, you know, quite significant coaching contract. He was over the moon. And um, she said, so I've started coaching the MD owner of a family business. And she's so happy with the coaching that I'm doing. She wants me to coach the rest of the board. So now, not only am I coaching her, but I'm coaching her four daughters as well, who are on the board. He said, but it's a little bit tricky. He said, because what I found out as we're going through the coaching, this is a true story, by the way. What I found out as we're going through the coaching is that there's one of the daughters that doesn't seem to see eye to eye with the mum or the other three. And it sounds like they're actually trying to get her off the board. And we had a conversation about, you know, the practicalities of that and the common sense of that and the ethics of that. Um, and he was very, very initially, very, very keen to rationalize that it was okay because he'd had clear conversations with everyone that he felt he could hold the confidentiality. And ultimately, he rationalized it because he said, but Tracy, I really need to set up my coaching business. And this is going to really give me some initial money. I left my job to set up my coaching practice. I've only got six months of my salary and I've got to start earning. So he started to rationalize that, yeah, maybe I can coach all of them because it will, you know, I can work it out and it will be OK when actually that's probably one of the most complex, uh, unadvisable coaching contracts that we could possibly imagine. So there's a, there's a big example, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen too often, but there's an example of how we could see rationalization happening. And that happened to be within a coach practitioner, but we might see rationalization within our clients or rationalization within the organization. Any other thoughts? 
Penny, does this trigger any other thoughts or ideas around where could we see rationalization happening in our work? Uh, I'd like to share, if I may. Go ahead, um, Tina. So I, I never gave it a word, but rationalization is exactly what it was from the client. Um, I'd been asked to coach someone who um, was being groomed for, for a C-suite position. And... You know, after the first session, I, I had some thoughts, but by the end of the second session, I realized that this individual actually needed therapy as opposed to coaching. And I went to his CEO and I said, you know, I have to pull out of this contract. Um, and, <laughs> and it was at a time that I also needed, um, you know, the, the money. Um, and the CEO kept saying, no, please, please don't, you know. Um, he, the, the guy I was coaching, is very, very happy um, with you as a coach. So, so please just, you know, continue. And uh, he kept rationalizing why I should continue. And I, um, I stood my ground and, and canceled the contract. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Tina. That's another great example. Um, I, I had another example that's just come into my mind when I was coaching. Um, I was one of many coaches in a very big sporting organisation here in the UK that was um, helping to prep some of the athletes for the what would have been the Brazil Olympics at the time. Um, and they got all of us as coaches together for the first time. And the first question that we were asked by the person leading the initiative was, um, well, we want you, we want to go around the room and for you to all tell us um, what's going on with the people that you're working with. What do we need to know so that we can make adjustments? And, you know, what do we, um, what's going on for them? What are their issues? What's holding them back? Basically asking us to tell, to breach confidentiality. And, and when I said, I, I can't do that because I, first of all, haven't even discussed with my client if they would like me or would be comfortable for me sharing. And even if they are, that's information you should ask them rather than from me. Um, but it was interesting that they they turned around and they said, oh, no, that's fine. That's how we do things here. That's how we that's how we operate. That's normal practice here. There's rationalization. And, and it was interesting how some of the other coaches, thankfully not ICF coaches actually, who, who went with that rationalization. Um, but I said, well, I'm really sorry, but I can't do that work. And, and I resigned. Um, and that was a big financial loss actually at the time. That was a really, really big contract. So, you know, there's all sorts of rationalizations that we could notice. And what we're, what we're just trying to invite ourselves to do here is it's just be aware of them, be alert of them and really slow down and start to think about what, what actually is going on here and what's, what's the right thing to do? What would be the right thing in this case? And as I say, we may have to seek or consult with others to work out what that right thing is. Um, so if we have a look, then some examples of rationalizations could be these. Um, you know, it's legal, therefore it's ethical, which is not necessarily always the case. Um, if it's ethical if it's just part of the job. Um, it's ethical if it's for a good cause. There's another rationalisation. Um, that's the way business is done here, which is similar to the example I just shared with you. No one's getting hurt, so it's all right. Um, it's ethical because it fits my personal beliefs. Yeah, so I think it's ethical, therefore it must be. So just a little note then to just be aware and alert of what kinds of rationalizations could be invited and how might we 
um, how might we take care of those? Um, and Shakti is saying here, thank you, Shakti. Ultimately, I will have to consult and explore various values when difficult situations come up and the decisions I make will influence me and my practice as a coach. I have to recognize the consequences and I also allow that to influence my decision. Absolutely. So we're pulling on a wide range of um, factors when we are um, considering an ethical query, which is why, again, we really need to slow down and think. Um, and I've got a little model for you around ethical decision making in a moment. A little bit on neuroscience and ethics. Um, I had a really in, I had a great opportunity a few years ago to go to um, a big conference by the um, Neuro Leadership Institute um, in the US. And there was a session on ethics and um, neuroscience. So I thought, wow, that would be interesting to explore. And these were the key things that I learned in that in that session was that um, the same neural pathway on the neural processes underpin the human approach to collaboration and competition. And so they are always going to be naturally in competition or uh, sorry, in attention for human beings. Um, so there's a it's a little bit like um, how we have the experience chemically and neurologically of excitement and nervousness are almost identical and it's really just how we frame that feeling that makes the difference and it's the same kind of thing with the neurology that underpins our desire to collaborate or compete they are really really close together neurologically and so we could very easily go one way or the other um, empathy can increase our ethical behavior because of similarity. So rapport and empathy can make us feel more ethically aligned with someone, more, more likely to want to be ethical towards them. But at the same time, it can also increase our unethical behaviour towards people outside of a group. So we have this idea so, of social groupings, of the in-group and the out-group. And we can, you know, in society feel that we can behave more ethically to the in-group that we're in and less ethically towards those who are in the out-group. A sense of distance can also increase unethical behaviour. We have this phrase, don't we? Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, we distance ourselves from something emotionally, physically, through time. And over time, it can, um, you know, it can sort of increase our sense of the rationalization and therefore the unethical behavior. Um, dopamine, as we saw with our beer drinker in the picture just recently um, on the previous slide, dopamine can increase unethical behavior. So when we are, you know, very, very high or, or we have a dopamine sh uh, rush for whatever reason, that can have a, a slight link to more unethical behavior. And also, as we've already seen and discussed, our values, our moral compass will influence how ethical we are. And research shows that those who take time to work through ethical dilemmas are more likely to act ethically as a result. So we, we know this neurologically, that slowing down, gathering data, seeking input, taking our time to consider various options is going to lead likely to much more ethical behavior um, than if we were to just have a, a knee-jerk reaction. Looking then for a moment at something slightly different, I'd love to just um, draw our attention to a couple of other aspects of ethics. And one of those is actually in the agreements, in the coaching agreement. So this links to the Code of Ethics and Competency 3. And the ICF um, have now identified within Competency 3, three levels of agreements that we are expected to um, work with our clients on. Agreements for the relationship itself or relationships and how we will work 
um, together. Also agreements for the overall coaching plan and goals that for a whole package of work and agreements for specific session goals and objectives. But there's another kind of agreement that is also very relevant in coaching and linked to ethics that is not so explicitly highlighted in our competencies that I think is worth is worth mentioning. And that is this idea of when we have three way contracting where there is ourselves, there is our coachee or our client and a sponsor, so a line manager or an organization. We have a concept here that comes in that is called psychological contracting, which may be something you are familiar with. And this is really where we're, we're looking at what is the unwritten or unspoken contract between us in terms of how we really feel and think about each other. Because that is where some of the ethics can be can be rooted. Um, for example, what we probably want to have ideally is a triangle a little bit like this that is hopefully some kind of a equilateral triangle where the psychological relationship between all three of the parties is equal, open and equal and transparent. But sometimes we can have a situation where one of the corners of that equilateral tri triangle gets pushed or pulled away from the other two. And just to share maybe a couple of examples, if we look at these four here in the top left hand corner, this is the this is the kind of triangle we would like. It's balanced. There is openness, there is trust, there is transparency, there is mutuality, there is respect between all three of the parties in an equal way. But what if we have a situation where we go to this top right hand one where the client or the coachee seems further away psychologically than I am with the organisation? And an example of this could be, let's say that I'm working in an organization. I happen to know the client's boss quite well. Um, I happen to quite like the client's boss. But the client comes to me and says they don't have a very good relationship with their boss. Um, in fact, they think their boss is quite aggressive and unreasonable and they've got a really bad relationship with them. What if I actually inside in my inner in my innermost self in all honesty, what if I start to think, well, I think that must be your problem because I've known your boss for many years and I think they're a fine individual. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with them. It must be you. That could be an example where the client becomes psychologically distanced in some way. You could also have a situation in this bottom right hand side where the coach and the client are very close together and the organisation is distanced. Let's say the client is sharing that they think the culture in the organisation is terrible. There's too much change. People are being made redundant. The processes aren't fair. Nobody's really being told what to do. And it's it's really it's a really terrible culture and place to be working. And I'm sitting there thinking as a coach, do you know what? I think you're right, because I've been working here for a few years and all my other clients are telling me this. I don't think this organization's treating people very well at all. And I'm finding myself in a place of more collusion, emotional, psychological collusion with the client and the organisation is more distanced. And then we could have a situation in the bottom left hand side here where maybe I'm the one that's being pushed away, that maybe the organisation and the client are feeling very tight together and I'm the one who's feeling marginalised. Perhaps an example of that could be where the client is saying to me, well, 
Tracy, I know you're a coach, but I, I, I welcome your perspective and I'm expecting you as a coach to give me some ideas and to give me some resources and to actually give me something that's valuable and tangible that I can take away and do. And the organization saying the same. And what if the coach is saying, but I'm not a mentor, I'm not a consultant, I'm a coach. And so the organization and the client are saying, well, you're not, you're not part of our psychological contract. So just wondering what you think about this idea of psychological relationship. I'll just come off the off the screen there if that gives rise to any observations or questions. The unwritten psychological contract. Barry, did you put your hand up there? And Claire as well. Barry then Claire. Yeah. That was that was very interesting to watch. Um, and I'm just wondering, even like when you notice something like that, even if you try to stay outside of it, if you've noticed it, there's probably a bias, I'm wondering. And then how you how you would handle that. Yeah, I mean, it's it, in some ways it's it's noticing it is the first thing, isn't it? You know, what if I don't even notice it? And this is where um, part of competency two embodies a coaching mindset talks about us being aware of the influence and impact of self and others. So, you know, to what extent are we aware? To what extent are we noticing and conscious of these things? And then the second question is, what do I do about that? You know, how do I try to reestablish a balance, if if at all possible? Is that balance or able to be um, established? Or am I going to fall foul of rationalizing to stay in it, even though it's psychologically out of kilter? Yeah, great questions. Claire, what did you want to bring in? Yeah, you know, if you think about a coaching relationship, right, and with a stakeholder, with the organization, um, the touch points with the organization and the stakeholder are much fewer, are, are fewer than your relationship with the client. And so for me, as I looked at all four of those pictures, the one at the bottom left actually seems more correct in a sense, because I am establishing a closer tie, a closer connection with the client. It's confidential. There are things that we say that are, that are not shared. The actual things that are shared are only the client stakeholder. So for me, it seems that that model is more, would more be in alignment with how I think about the coaching agreement as opposed to the uh, equilateral triangle. Yeah, thank you, Claire. I really love that perspective, actually. And I, 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 I agree with you that, you know, we will have probably, won't we, a closer psychological connection, a closer emotional connection with our client than we may do with the organisation if for nothing else, because of the amount and depth and intensity of contact um, and our confidentiality. I think what this is intending to highlight is at what point does that tip into me feeling a collusion with my client against the organisation? Yeah, so there may be a distance. It's more about is that distance problematic? in some way. So we're checking in with, I guess, our biases, our thoughts, our feelings, and whether we are, whether or not we are agreeing um, with maybe some of the things that the client is bringing in against the environment. So it's more about the biases and the hooks that it might create. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think, Tony, you have your hand up and then we'll maybe move move on again. Okay, I have a, just a quick question. Um, so I I do agree that you can get very close with a coachee, not maybe against the organization, but you're you're close with them. But I have a situation where the coachee 
is very unhappy and in all likelihood may leave the organization, which would hurt the organization. And I would hate to see that happen. So I'm finding myself trying to help the coachy as much as I can to change her mind. Not, not saying that, of course, but maybe having a heart-to-heart conversation with the organization so that she doesn't leave. Is that considered unethical? I mean, I don't want her to leave the company. It would be horrible for them if she did, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm recognizing that I'm feeling that way. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Tony, and and thank you for 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 sharing so openly that tension. And this is this is this is the richness of ethics, isn't it? You know, where we get that tension inside us. Um, it's it's very difficult without exploring that particular scenario in more detail to know exactly what would be the best way forwards. You know, so I wouldn't want to to sort of make a a, a rash comment on that, Tony, but. I guess the thing that that comes to me as a thought is really to invite the client to to really consider and think through what are the consequences of their decision one way or another. And ultimately, um, the client does have to make their own decision, don't they? And and we know that that very often in coaching, coaching can lead um, to people leaving their jobs. You know, the fact that we go into that place of deep reflection and um, and reassessing what we want, what we need, et cetera. Um, and even to the point where I know and sometimes I do this and I know other coaches do that, that sometimes I even flag that up to the organization before I start working to say, you know, this this does happen sometimes. Um, so I just offer that as a as a thought. Um but as I say, Tony, thank you for, for even acknowledging the tension there. And it sounds like it's something that would would warrant a broader, you know, just a broader exploration, really, of your thoughts and the, the different options and perspectives. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Well, I'm noticing that we're getting really close to our time. So I want to just share one more thing with you. Um, So I just shared the slides really, really quickly, and then um, we can come off the screen before we finish. There's a couple of slides I'm going to skip through here because when you see them, they will be perfectly obvious, um, which is just some thoughts on psychological safety here that we've just been discussing. And also an interesting piece of research that comes initially from therapy, but it's relevant to coaching as well how the nature and the quality of the relate whoops sorry the nature and the quality of the relationship that we have which is fueled by this professionalism and ethics according to to research into this area accounts for over 30% of the success of the actual outcome of the work so our ethical considerations our professionalism is really going to inform not just the relationship but the actual outcome of the work itself um and then really the piece i wanted to share with you is what are some of the things that we could consider to make ethical decisions and what i wanted to offer to you as well as these things here that are things we could consider is is really this slide here that I would you know encourage you to have a look at and even use as a tool moving forwards this was actually created by the ICF a long time ago by the ethics committee in 2006 and I don't know why it's disappeared I can't find it anywhere in the ICF system anymore but I've got a copy of it and I really like it so I always share it with people Um, and as I say you'll get a copy of these slides as well so this This outlines from what was originally the ICF ICF Ethics Committee at the global level, um, identifies seven steps that we are encouraged to go through, which really link to some of the things we've been talking about this evening. So the invitation I would leave you with is when you do have an ethical dilemma, um, maybe take this out, try and follow those steps, slow down, consider, get some input, gather the facts and really think through 
what could be various options um, and their consequences, rather than us just going to that knee jerk reaction, which so many of us, you know, can find ourselves doing. So I'll stop sharing there. I'm really mindful we've got probably a few seconds left, um, but I'll hand back to, to Jimmy or Lubna to um, just say a few words before we close. Thank you all very much. Oh, thank you, Tracy. That was fantastic. Um, it's always good to get an ethics, uh, a deep dive into ethics. And this was, uh, this was a great one. Um